Unit 6 is about bonding and molecular structure, and part 1 is just the basics about bonds. In case you forgot, there's two types, two main types of bonds. We've got ionic bonds that are the electrostatic forces that exist between ions of opposite charge. It's the force holding a metal and a nonmetal together, positive ions being attracted to negative ions like sodium chloride or potassium sulfate. Uh, the other main type is a covalent bond, and that's the force that results from two atoms sharing electrons. Covalent bonds exist between nonmetals. These are called molecular bonds. And covalent bonds exist in N2, water, anything that is a bond between nonmetals. We're going to take a brief detour and look at a third type, metallic bonds. Uh, metallic bonds are what hold metals together, and in a uh, metallic bond, each metal atom is bonded to several neighboring atoms in a 3D framework. We've only got a 2D representation here, but imagine several stacks of these iron atoms. Um, in a metallic bond, atoms are bonded at multiple angles, and this allows the delocalization of electrons. That delocalization means that electrons aren't just going to stay with the their parent atom, the atom that they showed up with. They're going to be able to move all over the uh, entire mass that's metallically bonded together. That's why metals are good conductors of electricity. They allow that free movement of electrons. I'm going to switch back to ionic bonds real quick. Um, there's energy required to break ionic bonds, and it's got a special name. It's called lattice energy. Uh, and that's the energy required to completely separate a mole of a solid ionic compound into its gaseous ions. It's just like the energy that's required to break covalent bonds, but it's called lattice energy because uh, covalent bonds exist in a lattice framework. Um, you're usually going to see the values for lattice energy given as positive numbers, like in this table. It takes 1,030 kilojoules per mole to uh, separate lithium fluoride, and those values are given as a positive because, remember, breaking bonds is endothermic. So lithium fluoride would have to absorb 1,030 uh, kilojoules per mole to break up that lithium fluoride. Lattice energy also increases with charge, or you can think of it as it increases with the number of electrons that have to move around. Lithium fluoride, it's 1,030 kilojoules per mole because we're just dealing with a plus one charged lithium ion and a minus one charged fluoride ion. But if we look at magnesium chloride, it's more than double the lattice energy because we've got the uh, we've got three ions that we're dealing with, a magnesium plus two ion and two separate chloride ions. Lattice energy also goes up with decreasing size of ions. And in case you don't remember what ZF stands for, effective nuclear charge, you might want to go back and remember how effective nuclear charge is related to the size of ions. Moving on to covalent bonds. Uh, there are several things happening in a covalent bond. There's several electrostatic interactions going on. In this representation over here, we've got two atoms that are starting to bond together. We have to deal with the attraction between electrons and the nuclei. The nucleus is positive, electrons are negative, so they're going to be attracted to each other. And we also have to deal with repulsive forces. The uh, nuclei are both positive, they're going to push away from each other, and same deal with the electrons, they're going to be repulsed by each other. And if you look down here, this is just an electron density map of a uh, covalent bond. So the representation that we use, the line between two atoms, is a very simple representation of what's actually going on. There's a lot of forces at work in a covalent bond. So covalent bonds are formed by atoms sharing electrons, but those electrons are not always shared equally. Uh, fluorine is going to pull harder on electrons it shares with hydrogen than hydrogen does. That's going to result in an uneven electron uh, distribution or unequal electron density. So if we look down here at the picture, if we've got two flu uh, fluorine atoms, they're going to have an equal electron density because they're both pulling, uh, they're both exerting the same amount of force on the electrons. If we look at HF though, there's a greater electron density around fluorine than there is hydrogen because 
fluorine is exerting a greater force on those electrons, so they're going to be more attracted to the fluorine end of the molecule than the hydrogen. This is caused by a difference in electronegativity. Electronegativity is a measure of the ability of atoms to attract electrons to themselves. And for our purposes, we need to remember that fluorine is the most electronegative element and cesium is the least electronegative element. So electronegativity increases as you go left to right across the periodic table and it decreases as you go top to bottom. That's another trend on the periodic table that you need to know pretty well. You don't have to have the values memorized, but you do need to know the general trend in electronegativity. The greater the electronegativity difference between two atoms in a covalent bond, that's going to result in that bond being more polar. So if the electronegativity difference is 0 to 0 0.4, it's a nonpolar covalent bond and the electrons are shared fairly equally. If the electronegativity difference is 0.4 to 1, we're going to end up with a polar covalent bond like in HCl up here. And in a polar covalent bond, there's going to be a slight positive uh, side to the molecule and a slight negative side. That's caused by that uneven electron density. Since there's more electrons, or the electron density is greater around chlorine, it's going to have a slight negative charge and the hydrogen end will have a slight positive charge. If the electronegativity difference is 1 to 2, it's a very polar covalent bond, it's a very polar molecule, so it's even going to have it's going to have even greater uh, partial negative and positive charges. And if the electronegativity difference is greater than 2, chances are you're looking at a metal and nonmetal and it's an ionic bond and there's no shared electrons, they've just been donated from the metal to the nonmetal. Your question for this section, using a table of electronegativity values like the one on page 353 in your textbook, determine the type of bonds present in phosphorus trichloride.